The AWARE Project's aim is to balance the public conversation about psychedelics, spread accurate information, and give a new face to psychedelia. We feel that this change will occur through connection and relationship, one individual at a time. We are calling on everyone whose lives have been improved through the mindful use of psychedelics to educate themselves and become ambassadors for the psychedelic experience. Show those around you that people who use psychedelics mindfully cross all social, racial, economic, and political boundaries. So we're really excited to have uh, John here. Um, we haven't had anyone um, talk about their experience from within one of these trials, and so it's really exciting to, to have him here to share his story and to talk a little bit about what this work uh, is and what it means, and uh, he'll talk a little bit more about how he um, got into this and, and everything else and what's, what's come out of it. And I, uh, I think that's I think that's about it. But just thrilled to have you here, John. And um, yeah, that's it. <laughs> Chief Terry Saul, he's a Choctaw Cherokee Native American from Oklahoma. He died when I was 11, which would have been 1976. And uh, he left a legacy of art that's just breathtaking. And uh, so I'm just sort of, there's some of the artists still in our family, and we're kind of exploring that. And the, the heritage of my Native American ancestry is, is a little bit lack, lax, whatever the word is. Um, and so I'm just starting to explore that a little bit more. Um, one uh, aspect of the Native American culture that was present in my teenage years or growing up was peyote. So uh, peyote buttons were around the house. My uncle taught me how to clean them. And I would filter them one by one until I had a nice little pile. And then go on an experience. But going on an experience when you're 13 years old, 14 years old is quite different as we know than when you're uh, an adult <laughs> and life happens. Uh, that said, I thought I would celebrate this with uh, his starting the, uh, the, the, the talk with his painting, which is, this is a Choctaw stickball team, which is kind of like a field hockey team, only it's quite a rough game, as I understand it, and so they're doing their pre-game dance, and we have some of the game accoutrement in our families, too, remaining, so. So tonight, uh, the diligent intention, I, I titled it that, um, because what I'm going to focus on intention, there's all sorts of uh, focuses I could uh, ascribe to, but it's uh, it, the intention is sort of um, it's sort of an overused word in an underutilized action, I think. And so the word's getting weak, and, and the action's getting less and less. So, um, it, but that that said, it, it, you know, it, we'll talk a little bit later about about uh, the sliding scale degradation or the, the rheostat of intention. It can be everything from, I don't have one yet, to um, my life depends on this. And this talk is based on my life depending on an action that I took and some quite good luck that I had in getting into the uh, MAP-sponsored MDMA-assisted uh, psychotherapy study in 2015. So I do want to thank uh, Ashley and this community, this community is astonishing. It's part of uh, my continuing therapy. Uh, it's very amazing just to see it grow. And the intellect and the heart in this community is incredible, you know? And I'm so happy that, that it's happening and I can be a part of it, you know? My contribution tonight is, is overwhelming. So thank you. <laughs> This is another painting uh, from my grandfather. I don't think it's dated, so we estimate it's from the mid-50s. Um, it clearly, it's an earlier piece. It's more crude. But if you look closely, you can see that it depicts a peyote ceremony. Buttons, hand on heart, hand on abdomen. And uh, we're happy to have that. That's my great-grandmother. <laughs> she pulled the Cherokee. 
Northeast Oklahoma. The hair to the floor. That's the only known picture of her. So, I think you're right. I think you're right. So, anyway, it's it's really great to, to cast this up on the screen like that. And when I tested my talk for time, it went long to my utter astonishment. So, I'm going to see if I can kind of uh, get a little streamlined. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So let's uh, yeah. so party with the truth. So what are we going to talk about tonight? That's a good question. Um, I'd like to think that uh, there's something for here. There's something here for everyone to take on tonight. But the story is how I got knocked on my ass in 2012 by a, a life-threatening illness. Um, and there's the whole section that I had devoted to the precursor to that, kind of maybe how that came about. Um, but I had to carve that out, but we'll touch on it briefly. Um, so we're going to talk about how this, uh, how I kind of had a heritage of a hard upbringing, you know, just a lot of dysfunction in the family, and uh, sort of pressures that I put on myself, and um, I had this kind of furrowed brow, drive, 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 you know, it's very familiar in the American culture, and I had it bad, and I still have it. However, um, it can be very dangerous, and so we'll talk about that, how the disease knocked me on my ass, how I was all the way down to the very bottom, you know, suicidal and everything, and how I found this study by chance, and used the MDMA uh, assisted psychotherapy study sponsored by MAPS to crawl out of this hole and to save my life. You know, it's 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 um, and it's still pretty close because I'm only uh, I think 18 months out of my graduation from the therapy, so a year and a half. Uh, and then we'll talk about kind of some of the insights that I had. I really want to get into those; they're very interesting. I'll read some um, some of the notes I have for myself that I would usually have on paper. Actually, up here you'll see my notes to myself, and and we'll see um, you'll see kind of how I recovered, came out, crawled out of the hole and some of the things that I'm doing now as well. So the uh, MDMA system, like everybody knows that MAPS is marching us through the FDA process to get this legalized for prescriptive administration and uh, getting very close. So uh, PTSD is what is kind of marching this through the FDA. It's um, close to the heart. It's, you know, it's, it's really what's pulling the whole thing forward. I was in a group for off-label, if, if, if you may or may not know what that is, it's so when it is legalized, a um, psychiatrist or somebody who can write a pad, you know, sign a, a prescription can write this for something other than PTSD. So there's some off-label groups that uh, are undergoing the MDMA therapy, autistic adults, couples with PTSD, and I think it's just one of the couple uh, who have PTSD, but the couple will ingest the compound and go through the whole therapy together, which is remarkable. And I was in a small group of 18 people, so lucky, man, so very lucky, that uh, had at one time a uh, life-threatening diagnosis. Most of them were cancer patients. As far as I know, I'm the only non-cancer in there. Most of them were recovered, did through chemotherapy, and had anxiety about whether it would come back or not, and how to live life after this. Um, but I, I, think I, I think I was the only uh, subject that had an ongoing disease that has no cure. And so I, the, the study ended up being kind of something uh, about something else for me. Uh, but it, the group was called uh, MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy for the Treatment of Anxiety Associated with Life Threatening Illness. And it was uh, only 18 people. So I'm just so, so lucky. I asked Rick Dublin, I was invited to do a, a talk at um, one of their fundraisers a couple months ago. And I asked uh, Rick if he would design a study called MDMA Assisted Psychotherapy for the treatment of anxiety associated with public speaking. And, I was <laughs> and later, one of the MAPS executives, the head of clinical trials, um, came up to me and said, we're actually doing that. <laughs> so uh, the idea I would like to kind of weave through and focus on is, um, and I wonder how, I'll have to check my time. Uh, intention, given enough gravity, and combined with truth and commitment, assures change. Um, and at the end, we're going to ask some, some open questions, open-ended questions about this. Uh, resolute and stubborn can save your life. Resolute and stubborn can kill you. As I talked about earlier, my upbringing, um, you know, I'm a driver. Uh, I was, I was a, I'm an athlete. And so 
unfortunately, the resolute and stubborn that saved my life is the same resolute and stubborn that brought me to illness. And uh, if by the end of this, hopefully you'll see maybe in your own life how some of these things can be applied and how you can maybe pan back a little bit. Um, so I call it the furrowed brow, my heritage. Thanks. I was a wrestler, high school and college, and a few years after college even. But, so that's where the, some of the ferocity and the technique, you know, some of, the, some of this kind of thing came from. Plus, it's nostalgic for me to see these photos. <laughs> Uh, so scleroderma is a disease I have. Uh, it's an autoimmune disease. It's a rheumatoid disease. Um, it kicked me right to death's doorstep. I'm standing here. I'm 90% better. Um, really no thanks to any Western medicine, astonishingly. Um, but I'm going to really abbreviate this story so we can get into some of the more interesting stuff. Uh, I had a business up in the Bay Area, and it was getting better, it was going okay, it was very tough. I was a yacht broker, I, I, I was a yacht broker in a yacht, uh, sailed the sailboats in Chicago. And um, I was house sitting for my parents up in the Oakland Hills, I was running around Lake Merritt in Oakland, and it felt like I had all of a sudden, I was training for a half marathon, I hadn't run a day in my life, I felt horrible. I had heart palpitations, so I went to the weight room, some male, just lift some weights, for a week. And um, over a period of about four days, I could barely get out of bed, my, my forearms were numb, my, I woke up with numb hands. My feet were swollen, I could barely stand up. Uh, I felt like I had the flu. And I thought, man, something is really trying to take me down. This is not just something ordinary. And so, uh, long story short, it took four months to diagnose <coughs> the, the thing. When I finally got from a general practitioner into a rheumatology office, <clears throat> there were two rheumatologists in the room, and they looked at my hands and said, well, we hate to tell you that you have something, but you really likely have scleroderma and we'll do some blood tests. And that is a rheumatoid disease, so you're in the right office. And I said, great, I don't know what scleroderma is. And the rheumatologist looked at me and said, but you look like you've got a pretty good attitude. And I'm like, oh, shit, what is it? You know? And I went home and looked it up. And I said, I'm screwed. You know, um, you could die in two years, five years, eight years. You could live 20 years, 25. But you could really just um, I down on the pain for the disease, which I'll get into a little bit more and describe. Um, and there's no cure for it. It's a miserable disease. So, it's, it, your cells spit out too much collagen. And so, basically, you know, that happens you just get a lot of people get kind of seized up. My hands were, my hands are 90% better, but they were kind of frozen in this position for a long time because the collagen builds up. Everything gets tight. I was so, at one point, I was so covered with collagen that I couldn't stand up straight. Um, and it, the collagen starts coating or scar tissue, you know, scar tissue starts happening in your internal organs, in your heart, your kidneys, or your lungs, your toast. There's not much they can do about it. You can end up on a feeding, getting fed by a tube, or you're dragging around an oxygen tank, all sorts of things. And I have some friends that have this disease and they are absolutely my heroes. It's un unreal. Um, it's a super painful disease. It's debilitating mentally, debilitating physically, debilitating, and it's just um, really hard to manage. So. You know, I've had to be a scientist about how I manage this thing. Uh, what does it feel like? It feels like, you know, and I'm keep in mind I'm a lot better, but back in when I was at my worst, it's like waking up with a terrible flu every single day. Like, is this ever going to end? You know, um, with a stack of bad like red wine, red wine hangover on top of that, and just uh, you can't tolerate certain types of foods. And you get so fatigued that you feel like you're just bled out. Like I'd be in the grocery store, I'd get the groceries to the car, sit down and drive home, and I just felt like I bled out. I could not move. I had to sleep for an hour, you know. And we call this uh, a spoonie. Does anyone know what a spoonie is? Nobody knows. Okay, spoonie is a kind of a new term for people with autoimmune disease, either fibromyalgia, MS, lupus, these diseases that that really make you super super fatigued. And so uh, an analogy was made by one of these patients that went worldwide, it went viral. It's like you start the day with a handful of spoons, and each thing you do, tie your shoes, brush your teeth, you know, get the kids out of school, whatever you do, you're, you're giving away a spoon. And you're hoping at the end of the day you got one spoon left for yourself to do something. And a lot of times you run out of spoons early. So I'm a spoonie, and you call anyone that you meet with an autoimmune disease, ask them if they're a spoonie. It might cheer them up a little bit. Okay, excellent. Um, a couple of the things uh, to add to that is that chronic pain chips away your will. I mean, I've got a very strong will. A chronic pain, if you, if you know anyone or if you've had it yourself, 
you know, it just chips away, chips away, chips away at your will, and it will take anybody, to, you know, all the way down. Um, my mental toughness carried me for a time. When the mental toughness runs out, you're like, okay, I'm not as tough as I thought, or I just, or I run out. And your spirit, something intangible carries you along. And then you're just tapped out, you're wiped out. You said not, nothing left, you know. So, you know, very uh, sobering questions come up. And then, you know, knowing, knowing how you're going to die is, um, and in all likelihood, that's what will kill me, but, you know, and it could kill me at any time, which is really the ferocious part about this disease is it could rear up next time and just take me out. So, um, it's weird, but it's uh, one less thing to worry about, is how I look at it. So. Uh, this is, I didn't put these photos of my hands in at their worst, because they're just, they're, they're too gross. So, these are kind of some of the raynons on this ship, you can see them, but the circulation gets pretty bad. Uh, the collagen, uh, you know, constricts the capillaries, so you get this neuropathic or neuropathic pounding like you would in advanced diabetes. And so what causes the pain also is this pounding, the blood trying to get to your capillaries, your hands and feet. And then your hands, if you're exposed to cold, get hyper reaction to cold or stress. And if you get a cut on your hand, go ahead and advance through, right through the, see the collagen collects and your hands collect, go ahead. And, and then the circulation is, is uh, not adequate in the fingers. And if you get a cut, it can take off. You know, and I still, my hands are probably the last um, thing to come along. And I, I can get a cut, thank you. I can get a cut and it'll get infected. I almost, lost, I almost lost this pinky twice this year. So I have to be super, super careful about not getting cuts in my hand. Keeping the compression gloves on, which keeps the circulation moving. And um, doing yoga and, and rigorous hand therapy. I'm spending too much time on this. Um, this is a painting I found online about three, two, two years ago, and when I came across it, I'm like, wow, that's what I feel like, you know? That's what scleroderma feels like right there, so if the words don't drive it home, that's what it feels like. Absolutely painful and miserable, you know? Okay. Uh, reckless with suicide, great. So I'll, I wrote an article that was in one of the maps bulletins um, that kind of captures this. Um, I'm going to do another time, actually. Oh, okay. Okay. As several months before I discovered the MAPS sponsored study, I watch another capsule of expensive medicine skitter across the floor. It escapes under a heavy piece of furniture. I give up, I said to myself. This has become routine. My disease, systemic sclerosis, is also known as scleroderma, is all that paradise my fingers and made them hard as plastic. Every morning I wake, I hope to find that the last 950 days have been a bad dream, but it's never the case. I take 20 minutes to force a decision. Get out of bed. I do it. I'm skinnier than the day before. I feel like I weigh 400 pounds. I feel arthritic, stiff, feverish, like I've got the flu every day. I feel toxic, like I bathe in pesticide. My skin crawls and burns. My feet and hands pound as blood forces through the capillaries. My heart skips and slams for a few beats, and I'm short of breath. Uh, fatigue drags me toward the floor. My inner voice says, I can't do it. Just let me sleep. I email two clients to reschedule, and the office will have to stay quiet today. My business is hemorrhaging money. Oh, it's 9.45 a.m. Time for a little warm and cozy. I break the 10 milligram Percocet in half and chew it down with a glass of water. I pocket another 10 milligrams for the afternoon. 10 minutes later, I change my mind and I get ready to go to the office. Maybe I'm getting better. I'm fooled by the opiate, but it's doing its job. So went my life and my business for three and a half years circling the drain. I'll never feel the high of a, a running on a trail again. I won't enjoy my body, feeling strong or after a week of weightlifting. I'll never sail my boat again. My friends have stopped the invitations or ripped me off. It's only 51 degrees outside, but I can't feel my feet. My hands are white. I can't move them. Suicide stops by for a visit. Hey man, let's go for a walk in the woods. We'll do you some good. So that was the shape I was in when I uh, opened the San Francisco Chronicle newspaper and uh, saw the article, Ecstasy Therapy Approved for Trial in Marin County. So the study found me. It's actually a later article that, uh, for all intents and purposes, the Don Lapp is the same author. And so uh, I called him up right away and said, hey man, I went in this trial. And I was quite lucky. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, who are the angels? So, I found a trial, I applied, you know, uh, went in for an interview. Uh, my therapists are old school, um, just 
old school therapists, they were doing this back when NDMA was legal before it was, was Schedule One. You know, and they are super, super experienced. Phil Wilson is, um, his son died of leukemia when his son was 16, and then he wrote a book about it called Noe, a father-son song of life, love, and death. And I haven't, I'm not ready to read it, but I'm almost ready to read it. I'm going to find a copy of it. It's out of print, and I'm going to read it. Um, I'm ready now. Um, that's Phil Wilson and Julaine, my therapist. It's, this is at my one-year anniversary dinner. They took me out to dinner after my one-year uh, review. Um, that's Phil Wilson. That's David Nichols. He made the MDMA that went into my stomach. It was a batch in 1986, the purest MDMA in the world. And that's Alexander Sasha Shogun. And Sasha Shogun and Phil Wilson were best friends. So I knew I was in good hands. Okay. Um, opiates. So to get into the study, um, I had to have a clean urine test. I had been on opiates for three and a half years necessarily. Now opiates are getting a super bad rap, as we know. But they saved my life too. There are a lot of things that saved my life. They did the job. I was on them on the clock, 30 milligrams a day on the clock. And they enabled me to continue my life, in, you know, in the only way possible. You know, I mean, they're, they're underrated in terms of mitigating pain, elevating the mood. They do what they're supposed to do, but of course you're a slave to them. And, you know, when you want to feel, figure out what the difference is between the pain from your disease and the pain from withdrawal, it's confusing. I tried to taper a couple of times and I thought, whoa, that's going to be hard. I'm going to have to go into a clinic, get the buprenorphine or, or something. And uh, when I found the study and Phil Wilson said, buddy, to get in the study, you need to be off the opiates. I said, done. He said, here's a tapering schedule. I said, thanks. I brought the tapering schedule home. I threw it in the trash. I looked at the bottle of pills. I said, that's it. I took the last one at 9 a.m. It's 3 p.m. I put the, sh the remaining pills where I could see them in plain view. And I just stood them off. And I was on the phone with my best friend for about four hours that night, just going nuts. So, um, you know, it, if I can do it, I have an addictive personality too. If I can do that, anyone can do that. So, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that you can do if you have anyone that, or you know anyone that you're concerned about opiates, it's possible you can get off of it. I did a cold turkey. I wouldn't recommend doing it that way. It's really, really rough. But this is when I made the decision that this study is my, my Hail Mary, man. This is it. I'm not going to make it, you know. And I'm going to pivot my life on this thing, you know? Thank you. So how does it roll out? Um, you know, I visit with a therapist, I think, five times. They get to know me. They said, John, we'll know you better than anyone in your life knows you. And by the end of the study. And so uh, I did a lot of work, man. I wrote notes. I wrote topics and things I needed to work out. Just a wide open book even before the study started. And uh, so we have these sessions, and then we have overnights. And the overnight is when you come in at um, 9.30 a.m., and you get your, your dose or your placebo. I actually was in the placebo group for the first two sessions, and it's all blind. So the good thing about that is that um, I got more time with the therapist. And the weird thing is I messed up their data a little bit, and I feel guilty about that. But they asked me after my placebo dose, after spending all day at the house, do you, the next day, do you think you were dosed or do you think you got the placebo? And it's blind from the, the doctors and the, and the therapists, and it's blind from the, the, um, the patient, me. And I said, oh, 100%, I got dosed. And I've had psychedelics in my life. I said, I got dosed. And what happened was I was still really kind of withdrawing. It was only three weeks, maybe three and a half weeks. I needed another week. So I was very amped, and I thought I got dosed from the MDMA, and it wasn't the case. So I was 100% sure I'd been dosed. Um, but the way it rolls out is, so we went through those two. I had my two placebo overnights. It was un, uh, uh, unblinded. I said, you check that, really? I mean, oh man, I felt like, like, wow, okay. Well, the good news is you get three more overnights and sessions in between and more time with us, which is all good. But you're assured to get the compound. I said, sign me up. Um, this is the tripping couch. <laughs> this is the room. Uh, a lot of work took place there. It's hard work, man. It's not all rainbows and bubbles. Um, you know, there's squirrels playing outside. You know, it's just a phenomenal place. It's their house in, in, uh, on a hill in Marin County. So it's just, I'm so, so lucky 
the set setting, you're talking about ideal. I mean, these are some experienced people that are angels, you know. And then the set and setting is amazing. So when you open your eyes and you go down for, uh, you know, some time on the couch, uh, you open your eyes, this is kind of what you see. They build a little altar by this window that looks out over Marion County. And it's absolutely gorgeous. And I used to joke with them. Um, I, I, would, I would say, they said, you feel it? I said, no. And it was on the third session. And I was joking, I did feel it. Okay. Um, it's been like an hour or something. I think I need to go to the bathroom. So I'd get up and wobble to the bathroom and Phil would be like smiling. And I'd look in the mirror and go, oh, dude, you are really fly. And so you come out on this landing and you're like three steps up from the living room floor and this is what you see. It's this astonishing room and I paused and I just said, and Julian looked at me and said, how's it going? I said, I'm flying. Okay, get out on, come down on the couch, wrap up. You know, so the, the way that, that's the way it, it that's the way it rolls. Is that you have a lot of homework that you've done. Topics will come flying out of your mouth when you're done, and, and they'll grab them and you'll address them. Um, the most uncomfortable stuff ever, you know, and it's just it's not uncomfortable. You get the, you get right to it, and uh, the insights are are fascinating to me, and I think fascinating to the community at large. That's a uh, Max, the therapy dog, is no longer with us. But imagine just flying. Like we're talking about 187 and a half milligrams of David Nichols MDMA on an empty <laughs> stomach in the morning. And Rick Doblin says this is the mildest psychedelic. Like no joke, man. Like and then there's two. It's 125 and then 62.5 an hour and a half later. So that dog comes and puts his wet maw on your thigh. It's like a special occurrence. <laughs> Uh, so the therapists were on the road with me, and I, I don't know, what, I'm not trained you know, in that area, but you know, there's some boundaries, uh, I'm sure. Uh, go ahead and see what the next slide is. Um, and the boundaries, I think, normal talk therapy are totally broken. So the therapists are in it with you, they're on the road, and I think there's, these boundaries are blurred. You know, and, and you know, one of the hardcore parts about that is after the therapy's over, you're so chummy, like you're in love with the therapist. And that's just what happens, and they're willing to do that, they're experienced, and it's all good. But it, I think that these blurring of boundaries is um, pretty incredible. So I don't have time, but I'll, I have choices here. Um, let me, let's see, this one is different. I think that's, that's one that, that one's in writing, so I can point anyone that wants to see the, that piece, um, Lunge Reverse Share. Reverse Share. The re Reverse Share is a story, and that's when we're talking about the boundaries. I, I was down on the couch, eye shades on, and I chose ambient music over headphones, and the sun was beaming in the window, and I had been down for quite a long time, and it was almost time to sit up again, although you don't really have a concept of time. I opened my eyes, and Phil Wilson's sitting there in the chair, the sun lights on his face, and he's crying. And, and so I sat up, I said, give it to me. And he proceeded, I won't tell the story exactly, but he proceeded to tell me a story about when his family is going through this hard time with his son having leukemia, traveling around the country, trying to save him, and how, how his son was so angry, and how they were dealing with that, and how his son eventually came to a place of gratitude. And he told me the story that just went all the way to my core. Like, it was, I was, he was sharing with me. I was holding space for him. And it's so amazing. So that's, I don't think that's standard in talk therapy. I just don't think that happens, you know? So that wall is broken and reversed, and it was one of the most meaningful experiences I've ever had in my life. And I had to, when I sat up, I just said, hey, hey, I can, I can take, you know, give it to me. So that's profound. So in the interest of time, I can't touch on these other ones. Let's see what's next. Um, so acceptance. These readings that I'm giving you were not so much written by me as they wrote themselves. So one of the insights during the therapy, I titled Acceptance, and I'll just read it. About this new tool for happiness and contentment, acceptance. How do you decide which circumstances you accept and which ones do you stand your ground? Where do you let it go and where do you refuse to settle? The answer came. 
Acceptance and stubborn resolve coexist. Acceptance has the upper hand, and it must come first. Resolute stubbornness waits in the wings. The two are different wavelengths and live in different time zones. If you want to breathe life into the things that your will represents, you have to come to levels of acceptance of the things you think you cannot accept, including acceptance that you may not realize the objects of your will. As a consolation, one of the things you can always change is your view of things. The power to change your view of things has a profound effect on your actual circumstance. So um, I wrote this, this sort of poured out of me also. Um, the days following medicine, you'll experience some weight. There'll be some raw emotions. Uh, this just came flying out of my thumbs into the phone. Um, work with your thoughts, your positive and resolute intention during this time. A lot can be accomplished here. You're cashing in on your insights, your connections, and your ideas during this time. Write down your thoughts. The medicine is not finished. Crying. Uh, the rinse, I think that's a short one for me. A lot of times I would uh, just be driving my car, and this is after the therapy or between the second and third sessions, and I would just be overcome with overwhelming empathy for the human condition. I would start crying, and I would have to pull the car over. I mean, crying that hard. And then I cried out, and I grabbed my phone, and the stuff just poured out of me. You know, it wasn't like I said, let me write something. So this is the rinse. Uh, we're almost always corked up. What miserable tension we tolerate. What happens when you reduce the stoppers of uncomfortable emotional display to the bare minimum? Sadness, the most available emotion when embracing the human condition, rises to the top, and you allow the levy to give way. What's the benefit? What's the beauty of allowing this breach? Like the tide, when it happens, it happens. There's no fight, there's no energy wasted, you are rinsed. Oh, can you go back on? Um, how am I doing on time, guys? Okay. Um, I can maybe get a couple of these. And so, related to crying, <laughs> this is before the therapy. I was uh, withdrawing from opiates, and one of the symptoms of withdrawing from opiates is you just cry, and you can't help it. So, I was, I had a big day where I, was, I had to go to the bank, uh, bank a transaction, you know, do checks, get the get all the decimals right, write commission checks, and I had to be perfect. And I was just, <laughs> I was just miserable. I was withdrawing from opiates. So I'm in the car, and it's, it's 10 minutes before the bank closes, and I'm just crying. I put my sunglasses on, tears are just pouring out. And um, I go to the teller, I said, uh, I can't remember her name at the moment. I said, I'm withdrawing from opiates, can you forgive? And she said, yeah, let's just do this, we'll get it right. And uh, no problem. I told her I was withdrawing from opiates, and I'm just raining out from underneath my glasses. And that's the first lesson about crying that I had even before the therapy started. Uh, pull over and write. I sort of just told that. Kick it out is quite useful. Um, it's it's healthy to cry, you know. And so sometimes it gets stuck. You know, sometimes you just feel anxious, angry, or something like that. And you just need to, you need to do it. So I just purposely think of the saddest thing I can think about. Like I think of. Uh, it sounds weird, but I think about like a family in Syria getting torn apart, you know, or trying to, you know, something like that. Really, really sad. Because I'm already going to cry anyway, and it's stuck right here. So when it comes up to here in the throat, you know, I just get it as high as I can, and then I'm going to turn my ears, just kick it out. Hey, John, just kick it out. Kick it out. Just have yourself a good cry. Um, and that's just a technique I came up with, and man, it works. Uh, the Marin Joseph story, I don't think I have time to tell, but man, it was, I'll just tell you about that. Um, after the therapy, I had these weird synchronicities happen over about an eight to ten week period, where people just sat next to me and just told me the most personal stuff you could ever imagine, right out of a total stranger. Me, I have a sign on, the, on my back, like, tell me your most sorrowful life problem, man, you know? I mean, this is stuff like my wife's dying of cancer right now. We just got out of, I was at a diner, at, at, a, at a counter, empty. The guy sits right next to me. That's kind of odd. Orders his food. My wife's dying of cancer. I just came from UCS. I said, I'm so sorry. That sucks. And I looked in the back of his eyes and I held his face for him. And he said, it's so unfair. We had everything going so well, you know. Um, 
She was fought up twice, we thought it was over. Um, and I'm so sorry, dude. And I'm sitting here like, I'm holding the station. Like, Give it to me. And he says, well, she got out of surgery. You know, he was waiting out of traffic jam. He came into the diner to wait out the traffic. And uh, uh, he said, um, I got out of surgery today and the doctor pulled me out in the hallway and said, well, we got the tumor. That's the good news. The bad news is there's 25 more. She's not going to make it. And so he said, he said, man, my wife's back at the hospital right now planning a vacation to Tahoe. And I don't know how this is going to happen. No, it, it can't happen. The only thing I could think of to say is, I was just out of the therapy, I said, you know, um, just when you see her, just bring some joy into the room. Anxiety is the unwelcome guest in that room right now. That's the only thing I can tell you. And I'm so sorry, man, that's so, that sucks so bad. And it was profound. And then right in front of my eyes, he went from tense and kind of in this fighting mode to, he slumped, slumped in his chair and he said, she's gonna die. She's gonna die. I just said, dude, I'm so sorry. And like people in the restaurant, could see, it was an intense conversation about it. And I would not break eye contact with him. I just held that space. And I'm not experienced at doing that, but I did it. And so that's one story of like five stories that happened in like eight weeks, one after the other. And I'm like, what is going on? It's so weird. There's no statistical formula to ever, ever describe how that could possibly happen. And I'm like, whoa, that was an intense conversation. Wow. And the guy said, hey, I feel a lot better after chatting that up. Thank you. Shook my hands. My name's Steve. Said, my name's John. Thanks, man. And I went out to my car and said, whoa, that was heavy. And then I just burst out into tears. I cried so hard, like it, like I never had before. And that was just one of like three or four stories to see this life. Um, the click, if I could boil down uh, my benefit from the therapy, um, one benefit I did not read because I didn't have time to read it was, I th I'll just do it off the top of my head if I can find it. Um, th let's see. Okay, so I, I wrote this down between sessions and I brought it into the therapist. Throughout the day, 18 years of whatever lacked in my upbringing was gently placed into my heart. Then over the next 72 hours, it catalyzed there right where it belongs. And then I brought that in the next couple of days, my next session in to Julian, and I said, is that overly dramatic? Like, am I a drama king? That sounds overly dramatic. And she, and she said, no, that's routine, and that's good that, that, that you wrote that. And so the other thing that can boil down uh, my benefit from the therapy is something clicks in your brain, it becomes crystal clear that the stakes are this. Death after a fear-laden and desperate struggle for something ill-defined and, and unattainable, or death after a life well-lived and having touched the lives of others. And that just boils it down. And so, um, that's what it boils down to. I have a certain amount of time left. I don't know if the disease is going to kill me next year, two years, five years. Is that comfortable? I'm managing it. It's really hard to manage, but I'll be damned if my life is going to be not enjoyable and not meaningful. So that's that's kind of just something that wrote itself, and that's something I decided. Um, let's see what's next. Okay. I feel like I've left some things out, but uh, we're getting right to it. A matter of survival. Here's some tools outside of the psychedelic therapy that I use to get better. And I put, you know, I started putting this together before the therapy, during the therapy, and then it really accelerated after that. Music, and really underestimated power. If you can really just up your ante with your relationship with music and use it more, it's so powerful. You know, um, it, 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 it's 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 astonishing. A meditation, actually do it. <laughs> Yoga, get very good. My life depends on this stuff. You gotta say it. It's a matter of survival. I have to do this stuff. Um, for the myofascial tissue, I have to keep it stretching or I will stiffen up. So yoga, really deep into it. Exercise, you know, um, I'm, I'm running half marathons again, which is remarkable. Um, nutrition, I'm always experimenting. You can, you can really dial it in. Sleep hygiene, I call it Satan's final exam, sleep hygiene. <laughs> because it's the hardest one for me. Uh, I have something called a self-diagnosed delayed sleep wake phase disorder. I stay up later and later and later with no problem. I read, my brain turns on at 10 p.m. 
And then I go through a cycle where I eventually just skip a night of sleep. I have like a 36 hour circadian rhythm. So life happens in the morning though, you know, and that's when the good stuff, workouts happen. So I'm always trying to reel that in. And so sleep hygiene, uh, mirror work. You know, as suicidal, is look at yourself in the mirror. You know, just, it's, it's mirror work. Look at yourself and talk. Next one. Uh, human interaction. Get out of the house. Get with people. That's why this community is so amazing. You know, uh, human touch. Get it. Make friends uh, with your body. You know, say hello to your body. Pat it. Pat yourself down. You know, make friends with your body. Um, make peace with your body. My body betrayed me. You know, I have an autoimmune disease it's trying to kill itself, and I'm trying to. Hey, buddy. You know, let's let's work together. Um, psychedelic local community. Mentioned that. Volunteer. Do something. To help someone. Be there for someone. Get a cert certification, take a class, you know. I got certified to teach aerial yoga, and now I'm um, uh, going to study for personal trainer certification, which I always wanted. I've wanted for years and years. I'm finally doing it. Next. Uh, get right to the truth in every matter, gently. Not like a drill sergeant, right? Which is what I used to do. Uh, so that's, again, that's the voice in your head, making friends, make a friendly voice. Uh, continuing education, psychedelics done well. Okay, uh, a lot of people ask me, are you continuing the psychedelic, you know, self-inspection? Yeah, I'm right. You know, and do it well, because it works. You know, um, and don't go too fast. And do your research. Find your gut. Start listening to, to the gut in your heart instead of the voice in your head. You know, uh, find your stoke. I'm going to start surfing again. You know, I have a hyper reaction to the cold, but I'm going to do it anyway. I think I can actually reset my cold trigger point by getting in and out of the ocean. Uh, but find something that stokes you, because doing a job that, or doing anything that you're just ambivalent about, it can kill you. I'm living proof that it can, it can kill you, or it can try to kill you. Uh, so find your stoke. Exfoli exfoliation, that's specific to me, but it's nice, I think, for everybody. Exfoliate your entire body. That gets rid of the collagen, you know, so I have to keep loose and exfoliate. Cryotherapy is new, I haven't tried it yet. It's on the list, I'm doing it. That's when you get into a really super, super cold chamber. And I'm going to try to reset my trigger point for cold reaction. Um, micro choices is something I made up. Uh, when the going's hard and get overwhelmed, like the next choice is just too big, make a little tiny choice. Like, hey, I can see my mood kind of spiraling, and I, I felt it happen like one minute ago. You know, I'm going to make this little micro choice. Like, hey, I noticed that, and um, fuck you, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to go there. And so it's just these little tiny choices that you can make that are attainable. It's like a click on a ratchet. My friend says, be the ratchet. Click, 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 one click at a time. Uh, pray at pictures and feelings. This is new, something I made up also. I'm sure I didn't make it up. I'm sure it's been done for thousands of years. But what I do is, I, I was religious prior to my being ill. Uh, I wouldn't call myself religious anymore. Um, and I stopped praying for four years while I've been going through this. But I started to pray again, and all I do is I don't pray to a long white beard dude up in the clouds at all. I just pray, I just pray. And I do it in pictures and feelings. No words allowed. Don't picture a word, don't say a word, don't hear a word. You picture an image, and you feel the feeling, and you hold it, and then you move on. It's a good technique. I'll let you know how it goes. What else do I have? Um, internal also. I used to. I used to say this right off the top of my head. So, you know, what, what the therapy did for me by and large is when you get your, your internal house in order, it's not it's something easier said than done. You learn to entertain only the truth in your thoughts. You learn the medicinal value of crime. You learn to tap into this gigantic pool of empathy that's there, you know, to balance, to balance the loneliness and the fear and the anger of the human condition. You do that, your life changes for the better. And that's what I'm still working on. So my involvement in the study was absolutely the you know the pivotal event where I got in touch with this, and um, you know the, the study I reclaimed my life. It, it, no joke. The study got me to wake up, pause, and tap into love and courage. I'm running again to do half marathons, teach yoga. I started a nonprofit company in answer to a calling I got, which is up on the screen. I didn't have time to talk about, it. but I got a calling during the therapy to help others who've been knocked on their ass just like I was. And um, I'm just going to do my best to carry that out. Oh, that's my yoga swing. Oh, that's me, yeah, inverted.
And these are the two uh, entities that I'm trying to uh, kind of get out of the ditch and, and get moving forward. I've, I've come quite a long ways, but it's uh, time to start the fire animals a little bit. And I think that, with that, it, that's it. Oh, no, I forgot. Intention at the beginning. Let's wrap it up. Let's ask these open-ended questions. How can we harness an intention? How can we bring more truth to our intention? How can we bring more commitment? It's okay to not know your intention. Sometimes we'll do a group in integration circle and we'll have intentions and I have the urge to just, if I don't have one, I just make one up. But it's okay not to have one and just wait for it to come, you know? Um, questions like, when do we change our career? When do we install a meditation practice? When do we redefine a relationship? When do we dive deep inside? And when do we make friends with our body? And that, for sure, the end. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Thank you. That's a slide I carved out, but that's a magazine cover that uh, I used to uh, used to keep me going when we got going got rough. <laughs> uh, we have a special treat, and this is so super mind blowing. Ben Malcolm is going to play some live music for us, and it's going to blow your mind. Questions? Q and A. Oh, questions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> People have questions. Ask me. I'm I'm Jane. Would you mind sharing more if you feel comfortable for us uh, regarding the specific issues that you felt like when you worked through them in the therapy work through your signature healing process? Stuff that perhaps pertains specifically to your illness or is it more emotional issues from the past or both? Okay, so the question is, as I understand it, what issues were germane to the, the therapy itself, like the emotional, the illness myself? The illness itself. So that's a good question. And so that's I'll try to make it short. It was both. Um, I was worried about the disease getting into my lungs because one of the things it can do is <clears throat> it can cause fibrosis in your lungs and then you're on a breathing apparatus and then you're, you're dust. So uh, the other thing that can happen is your esophagus can go bad. You can get air, acid reflux so badly that you aspirate acid at night. I have to tilt my bed up. If, you're, uh, if you aspirate too much stomach acid, your lungs get fried also, and then you're dust. So I was concerned about the disease getting in my lungs. And I was on the couch just flying and getting these deep, clear breaths. I remember just this air was coming through that crack in the window. And I felt so oxygenated. And Julian put her hand on my chest and said, no, she should breathe. You how deep it is, how clear it is. I think she went out on a limb here, but she said the, the disease has not touched your lungs. And man, so much stress left my body at that moment. It was just astounding. So aside from the disease, yes, emotional issues, um, uh, relationship issues. We went all the way to the root of those. Um, and that's kind of what's missing from the reading that I skipped. And um, the, the area, the overlap between I couldn't tell the difference between physical pain and emotional pain. I could not tell the difference. Emotional pain felt like physical pain. And so we worked on all of it, you know, and I did a lot of homework. And so relationship issues, uh, I ended up closing my business, which is actually starting to do better, but it was killing me. So I, I and the therapist said, John, don't make any major decisions. Like, take it easy. You know, I'm like, no, I'm just going to ask the business. I'm going to move to Southern California. This is the Bay Area. Where it's warmer, I'll feel better. Um, and then redefine this relationship I'm in, and it did, went down the list. I'm going to do it right starting now. And I did it as fast as I possibly could, and it took a long time to get all that stuff worked out, and it's still getting worked out. But um, yeah, emotional issues, fear, you know, that was just a little note I made on my homework fear. And Jelaine grabbed it and said, Oh, we we're talking about something else. And she said, What about fear? Oh, that yeah, turned out to be the theme of the day. You know, how do you, how do you illuminate fear, shine a light on it, walk right into it with open arms, just march right into it, you know? That's a new approach for me, because I'm used to combating everything. Does that answer the question a little bit? Okay, yes, sir. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you think using 
other plant medicines or herbs or uh, traditional medicines as part of your ongoing protocol? Ed edible cannabis and very, 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 I mean, 10 milligrams and less edible cannabis um, mitigates my, my pain. I'm off opiates, so I still deal with a lot of pain, and it does a good job in very, very small doses. Um, psilocybin, and um, so plant, as far as plant medicines, that's that's it for now. I mean, you know, there's a list there, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna you do use the, the cannabis just in, in very small doses for pain. Yes, and it works. Yeah. I can talk to you about. Yeah, okay. Yes. Have you used MDMA before the study? That's the cool thing, I had not. Okay. I had not. You know, um, I had had some psilocybin and some mescaline experiences as a teenager. I had a little uh, marijuana industry at the age of 12 and 13. <laughs> um, but so the question I'm looking for yeah. is what, what's the difference in your experience of working with a plant medicine like that on your own and working with it in a guided, guided setting? Um, I haven't worked with it in a guided setting yet, only alone, and so I'm looking forward to that. And um, MDMA was my first guide of anything, uh, but I'm, but it's been, yeah, I've, I've experimented with LSD and psilocybin, and very, very carefully, and made sure everything was perfect. I did violate James Fadman's rule of not having a sitter. Uh, fortunately, it went well, and everything that needed to happen happened. And that's another talk. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating to me. And, and so far as it's going to be therapeutic, I will keep pursuing that. And when it stops being therapeutic, I will, I will stop. Yeah? Any other questions? Yeah, this one. Yes? Um, when you said you addressed several pains during the therapy, was there any kind of childhood pain or parental kind of experience or trauma involved? Yes, you know, and, I thought... And if so, yeah. and if so uh, do you think that that had a, maybe a reason or an origin for your disease? I know it's, it's far-fetched, but do you think that your, your trauma from your childhood may have brought on the disease itself? Okay, I hear you. So the question is, does childhood experiences and childhood trauma, for example, uh, Possibly um, one of the backgrounds of me getting desperately ill. The answer is yes, absolutely. Oh. And I thought I would come out of the therapy with a peachy keen relationship with with my family, who had circled up and we built a scaffolding of, of support, as you should do when either you or family or loved one gets ill. You should build this team scaffolding and support. And uh, that was one of the hardest things for me was to accept support from a source that I was ambivalent about. Mm. And it's still a tough thing for this day. So there's a lot of resentment to, that I'm working through still. And uh, the scaffolding and support is uh, still available. But as I get better, and there's a whole other talk, but as you get better, you start kicking the legs out from under this table of support. And getting better uh, is very hard because you learn how to be an ill person. And then when you start getting better, you start having to, again, like I said, take apart the scaffolding which is very hard. And we, yes, there were childhood issues, childhood, uh, my parents were only 20 when they had me, and I keep hearing, oh, but they did the best they could, I'm sure. And did they? Maybe not, you know, maybe not. So I have to come to terms with that, and they're great people, and I love them, but I'm still working through some of that stuff, and I would never have even gotten to that point without this therapy, no way. And we went, yeah, we went way back, way, way back to that stuff. We got all the way deep on that stuff. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I'm excited. Any other questions? Oh, one more. Yeah, one more. Um, do you know if the MDME you took was it based on the Sassafras tree roots or was it a synthetic word? I don't know. All I know is that David Nichols made it at Purdue University in 1986. Oh, 86, yeah. Yeah, so, it's a, so that maybe answers your question yeah, right there. The, the, the original Sassafras tree. Original batch. <laughs> Yep. So I'm excited. Ben Malcolm is here. He has. We're, we've got a couple of announcements before he. Announcements? Okay. So I'll let you all just hand it off to you. Ben, you could do that too. Ben is awesome, you guys. I just met this guy a few months ago. The guy is so killer. <laughs> oh, <my God. laughs> Thank you guys.
thank you so much, John. It was really both touching and informative. So, so thank you. This is dedicated to John and his incredible talk and his incredible journey and to every person that has experienced pain or trauma in one way or another and had the courage and willpower to go and seek whatever it is in the world that they need to find to begin, complete whatever they need to on their healing journey and healing path. It's also dedicated to my baby. I'm having a real baby, like for real. <laughs> So there might be another registry at the next event. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.
Thank <laughs> you.